Marianne Faithful has been many things throughout her half a century in music. A close confidant of the Rolling Stones, a pop star, a homeless drug addict, and a critically acclaimed comeback artist. Despite a career filled with personal and professional turmoil, Marianne Faithful has always managed to find her footing. Last year, just as Europe started to go into quarantine, Marianne was recording a series of spoken word renditions of 19th century romantic poems, scored by Brian Eno, Nick Cave, and her longtime collaborator, Warren Ellis. But then in April of 2020, Marianne was hospitalized with the coronavirus. Now nearly a year later, she says she's been deemed a COVID long hauler because of the virus's lingering effects on her lungs and short-term memory. On today's episode, Bruce Hedlum talks to Marianne Faithful about how COVID has impacted her work, her stalled biopic, and why she resented being labeled Mick Jagger's muse. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Bruce Hedlum and Marianne Faithful. We want to talk about your new album, She Walks in Beauty, which is you reading romantic poetry. When we say romantic poetry, we mean poetry from the great romantic writers like Shelley and Byron. and 19th century romantic poetry, English, yeah. And you read over these uh, sort of beautiful musical soundscapes created by Warren Ellis, who's one of your regular yes. collaborators, Nick Cave, Brian Eno. So first, when did the idea for this album come to you? Well, it's been an idea I've had for a long time, but I never thought it would come to the point where we could actually do it, you know, that the record company would be hip enough. It, it had a lot to do with meeting and working with my manager, Francois Ravard, and, of course, uh, Warren and Nick. What convinced the record company that this was a good idea? I'm not sure, but Francois did it anyway. It does seem very unlikely, you know, for record for any record company, it's not the most commercial project we've ever heard of, is it? No, but it is a terrific project, and it's... It is a terrific project. It yeah. is. And I want to talk about, I think, what makes it so terrific. But first of all, how did you choose these particular poems? I went through a lot with, with Head, actually, my producer, and Alex. I went through a lot of Shelley, a lot of... Uh, of Byron. Keats was the best one, really, because there's so much and it's so gorgeous. Not the best one, but the, the easiest one to find. Um, although we still couldn't do everything, you know. Well, the Thomas Hood one, the, uh, the Bridge of Sighs, I discovered that when I was about 14 or 15. And I loved it then. And I wondered, once I started making records at all, I wonder if I could ever do a record of poetry, like things I really like. Mm. And so I've been slowly gathering it together and having thoughts about it, and which poems I wanted to do for quite a long time. But what this project did for me, I never really appreciated or liked words with. But now, through this, I've begun to really love words with. It was very good for me like that. Oh, that's interesting. Uh, a lot of people who like Byron and Shelley, you know, part of the deal is they decide they don't like Wordsworth early on. Well, I, I don't think I did that consciously anyway. I just didn't really, didn't really get it, you know? Did you grow up in a home where poetry was part of your education, part of daily life? Uh, yes, I suppose I did, yes. Your father taught literature, right? No, he was a professor of Italian Renaissance. Oh, I see. Mm. But that meant Petrarch, Dante, all that. Mm -hmm. He was also yeah. a spy, wasn't he? He was, yes. Well, that's how we met your mother, I think. 
And that's, I was just going to say, <laughs> and that's how he met my mother, who was also, she wasn't a spy, but she was in, I mean, there was hardly any resistance in Vienna. But my mother was involved in it because it was very straightforward. My grandmother, my lovely grandmother, Flora, was Jewish. So there was no no question, you know. And, and your your mother also knew Kerville and Brecht and these people? Well, she only knew them to the, when they were going in for dance rehearsal into the theatre. She worked in the corps de ballet with Max Reinhardt. And when all the little dancers would get trooping in to the theatre for rehearsal, they would meet my uncle Alexander, her brother, and uh, Bertolt Brecht and Kurt Weil coming out after an all-nighter with lots to drink and lots of things written. Oh, amazing. Yes. And they would, they would all say, Good morgen, Herr Brecht. Good morgen, Herr Weil. That sort of thing, you know. They were just little girls, really. Did you ever meet them later in life? Oh, no, no, I wish. No, of course not. No, no I guess they were both gone. Not then. that old. Darling. Okay, well, I thought I'd ask. Yeah, all right. So, what kind of you said you read the Thomas Hood when you were fourteen? I came across. I think I was just very lucky. I somehow got hold of a book called Palgrave's Golden Treasury, hmm. and it was in there, and I read it, and I was just blown away by it, you know, and. A few of the other poems that I used were also in this book. But it was it was very broad. It wasn't just 19th century English romantic poets. It was all sorts of things. Poetry in general. But yeah. was the romantic poetry, was 19th century poetry, was that the poetry that grabbed you when you were young? Yes. And also that's the poetry that I studied with my wonderful English teacher. Mrs. Simpson, <laughs> when I, I think I was 17. And uh, I would have gone on with that if I hadn't been discovered. Do you, did you want to become a poet or an academic? No. no. Well, I don't know. I might have. I enjoyed learning. I enjoyed study. I didn't think I wanted to become a poet. No. My poor father once asked me what I wanted to do. Oh, no, I asked him. Oh, that was so awful. A trick question, really. I asked my poor father what he thought I should do. And he gave the wrong answer. <laughs> he said he thought I should be a social scientist, a social worker. Oh. And I was so shocked because, of course, I wanted to be a film star. <laughs> And then, you know, famously, when you were, I think, 16, you were discovered? Yes. Well, a bit older, 17, 18, yes. Uh, and you were kind of swept up into London at the time, and you... Yeah, on the Rolling Stones, and Andrew Lou Goldham, and all that, yes. And you recorded As Tears Go By. It was a huge hit. Yes. It wasn't a huge hit. I think it did rather well. It's a lovely, lovely song. It is. I still like it, yeah. And it's unfortunate, considering, considering your long career, you were always considered <laughs> like a muse to the Rolling Stones. Yeah, and that's really not a great job. <laughs> no. <laughs> it was accurate, but as, just not a good job. As jobs go, you know, I can think of better ones. <laughs> but yeah, I sort of was. But of course, I mean... I'm delighted that Mick or Keith or both found things to use in my brain. But that wasn't really what I wanted, no. You wanted to be your own star. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you had, you had a rough time of it for a while and homelessness and oh, addiction. Yeah. I suppose I did. But I had a lot of fun too, you know. But then really starting with, I guess, broken English. Yeah. That was my big comeback, wasn't it? Yeah. And when we think about it now, you were so young when you did that. Everybody... I was very young. It yeah. seemed so strange. Yeah. 
And since then, you've become this incredible interpreter of people's work. I mean, you've written songs of your own. As, as well as writing my own songs. You do, but you've, you've, By the way. you've covered so many people. One of my favorite uh, cover versions you've ever done, and you probably don't remember doing it, uh, was Sp- uh, Spike Driver Blues for the Harry oh, Smith. Oh, I do. Of course I remember. I mean, you know, one of my absolute very best, dearest, much-loved friends was Hal Wilner, who has just died because of COVID, and I miss him more than I can say, especially now with this lovely new poetry record. He wasn't here. I couldn't use him, and I miss him so much. And all that thing of Spike Driver Blues, which I love, was done, it was a show that Hal put together, and and he gave me to do Spike Driver Blues, and it turned out really well. Was that his idea to do that? It was it was Al's idea, yeah. Now, when he first suggested that, that's not your usual material. It's a American blues folk song. Well, I, I really love American blues. But, but my question is, you so often do songs, I think, Down from Dover by Dolly Parton is another great example. Where Lovely song, yeah. You bring so much to a song. When you sit down to say, okay, I'm going to cover something like Spike Driver Blues, What's the process? How do you how do you make that song yours? Oh God, Bruce, I don't really know. Something magic happens, and it becomes mine. Hmm. Is it is it something that happens with the musicians? It happens live, or it just when you're? It does happen live, but it also happens when I'm recording. And Hal was very clever, getting me to sing songs that I wouldn't know about, you know. I, I actually did know Spike Driver Blues, but there are lots of things, like uh, some of the things on Strange Weather that I didn't know, but I, I wanted to do it because I wanted to please Al. I loved him. I adored him. You know, the reason I'm asking is, in some ways, this current album almost yeah. feels like cover versions of great poems. I know that's a silly way to say it, <laughs> <laughs> but but when I listen to it, and, you know, I've had to learn some of these poems in high school like everybody else and didn't enjoy of them, course, didn't remember yeah. them. And that's one of the reasons I chose some of them. I wanted to use choose poems that a lot of people would have heard of or known. Mm-hmm. But it's an amazing experience listening to them because... I feel like I'm hearing them in a different way. In the same way when I <laughs> hear you do Spike Driver Blues... I understand yeah. the song, or I feel the song in a different way. Does that make any sense? Yes, especially with Spike Driver Blues, because that's so far from my life and my own experience. But I feel it very much when I, when I did it. I really felt it. I understood it. I knew what it was about. And I wanted to really get it right, put it across. And with some of the songs you've done, as tears go by, uh, "Baby Blue," um, you've done you've done some songs at different points throughout your career. You've done three different versions of "As Tears Go well, By." Well, "As Tears Go By," yeah. I I never felt I really got it right, you see. And Warren particularly wanted to do it again, and I agreed. I thought, well, let's try it again. And what? What were you thinking about the second or third time you did it? How was it different for you? Well, it's very straightforward, very simple. The first time, it's really quite a perky little pop song. But it, the strange thing about it is that it's a song probably meant to be sung by a woman much, much older than me. I was 17. And the second time I did it was when I I'd, I'd just stopped taking drugs and uh, I think it was very very sad it was very it was sad because I was sad you know you were sad because you'd you'd stop taking drugs and I think so yeah I hadn't got to the bit yet where you realize how wonderful it is to be not taking drugs (laughs) did that take a while not too long but yeah it didn't come right away 
And then you did it in 2017. What was it like doing it then? Well, then I really felt I was in the right place to do it. The right age, the right place, the right time, and with the right people. So if you listen to all three versions now, would that be your favorite now? Yes. Yes, it is. Okay. And you've done other stuff. You've done Sister Morphine a couple of times. You've done Baby Blue a couple of times. You're a little bit like Frank Sinatra. You do things at different points in your career. Am I? Wow. I, well, I mean that. I mean that sincerely. As someone who. No, I, I agree. Yeah. Thank you. I adore Frank Sinatra. I respect him a lot. I want to talk more about these poems because, as I said, they they feel like a, yeah. the great cover version of a song. <laughs> I want to ask you more about Bridge of Sighs because I think, in well, some ways, it's your best performance on this. Well, one of them. There are there are quite a lot of really good performances, you know. Mm-hmm. I think um, The Lady of Shalott, The Ode to a Nightingale, Ozymandias is really good. To the Moon is fantastic. Yeah, you do it twice. Well, that was Head's idea, the producer, my producer and engineer. And he did something so brilliant. He made it sound. Like, I do it, and then it sounds as if the moon does it back to me. Oh, I like that. So do I. So, you know, a lot of these, and it's romantic poetry, so a lot of them are about death. Of course. And a lot of them are about women who aren't like you at all because they're either, you know, they're either these temptresses, like in the the Keats, Mm. or they're... They're victims. Bridge of Bridge of Sighs is about a a, a a woman who kills herself. Yes, she throws herself off a bridge into the Thames. Yes. Yeah. Tell me what what that's like for you to read. Did that have any personal? Well, I, I think it it got to me more when I was much younger. By the time I I recorded it, I was well over that sort of thing. <laughs> there was no way I wanted to be a victim, and I was. Mm-hmm. But she is, and I don't don't dislike her for it. That's just how she is. Do you have a favorite on the album? Oh God, I, I don't know. Both Warren and I particularly do love Bridge of Sighs, probably because it's got this wonderful rhythm, and the alliteration and the rhyming is so brilliant. But a lot of them have that, you know. Did you record these first and then he composed the tracks yeah. underneath? Yeah. I recorded them with Ed in London and we sent them, Ed sent them to Warren in Paris and he then composed the music. Are you in London most of the time now? Yes, I've just moved back to London. I was in Paris too. But my son really wanted me to come to back to London and I realised that I really hadn't given him enough time and attention in my life and I should and I came back and I wanted to be with my grandchildren too I like them very much the other thing about these poems and this really got to me when I was listening to it over and over yeah which is I mean so many of them are about separation or being solitary particularly on and I'm going to say side two because that's how I still think of these things um, you yeah. know, to the moon. We'll go no more a roving. And Lady of Shalott. Yeah. They got to me, I think, because of the isolation everybody's been living in in the past year. Yeah. Uh, you know, certainly in, in roving, uh, there's yeah. the line, and I'm going to get it wrong, but uh, something to the effect that the heart must pause to breathe and love yeah, itself. No, you got it right. Have rest. <laughs> It really got to me, I think, because of... Of course. Now, you recorded yeah. some of this before you were sick. Yeah. Some of it after. But, you know, already uh, it was all, almost, or in fact it was, lockdown when we recorded it. So we knew what that was. Both Warren and I and Ed, we all realised that this was a great, great record to give people and to make at this moment. We were talking about the songs in the second part of the album, and you said, in some way, you were thinking about the isolation people were 
we're going through. And I mentioned roving, but I think the performance that you know really got to me was uh, Lady of Shalott. Oh yeah. Well, that's it's a very interesting poem. It's about I, I think anyway. It's really about a narcissist who can only see life through a mirror, and when the mirror cracks, I don't really know why it cracks. She does something wrong, doesn't she? Oh, she looks at life straight, yeah. Yeah. And at that moment, the mirror cracks from side to side. And then she starts to sing her swan song, and she's going to die. She gets sick of it, looking at everything through a mirror. Is that wonderful line, I am half sick of shadows, said the Lady of Charlotte. She is a narcissist, but in another sense, it's about someone who... It's at a great distance from the world. She lives beside Camelot. She's not allowed to look at it. No. And so when she tries to enter the world by looking at it, she has to die, which again made me think so much of people who want to be closer to other people now are taking an enormous risk. And, you know, in in the, her, her body floats up to, to Camelot where everyone can see her in her song. She dies. I can't, again, I can't remember the exact line. But to me, it reminded me so much, you mentioned Hal Wilner, but uh, of reading obituaries of people you might not have even known about, and then you find out that they're gone because of this. I found that very resonant. Yeah, me too. But I've always felt that about that poem, yeah. Oh, was was that another one you'd always liked? Yes. And a lot of people do, you know. It's, a lot of people know that one, I think. You know, these poems aren't fashionable right now. No. In a way that romantic poetry isn't. I think we want things either more absurd or more direct. Um, do you, yeah. But you still find something in them. Do you find new things in them when you read them? I don't care. I never think about fashionable. It doesn't mean anything to me. I love the beat poets. I love all sorts of things. And I love... 19th century romantic poetry, too. And I'm glad if people aren't aren't all sort of making records like this, because that means I can. But you've also been on this run of terrific albums from Easy Come, Easy Go and uh, Give My Love to London. I loved that one, yeah. Mm -hmm. Which is also a great song you wrote with uh, Steve Earle. Who I love very much, too, yeah. What do you account for this level of success at an age when most people are looking back on their past work? (laughs) I really don't know. I really don't. When you go in to make an album, do you you have a particular idea that the the album is going to be one thing or another? So I think I must do deep down, you know, but I I don't really say it out loud. Okay. Um, yeah. But you said this one out loud. Yeah. I'm going by feel and instinct. I don't really know exactly what I'm doing. I think Hal did, but I don't really. Or maybe I do, but I just don't admit it. I don't know. Well, you, do you ever wonder if, if you were ascribing things to Hal, he was really just bringing out in you the ability to do these songs? <laughs> I, I never thought of that, but... That might be true, yeah. I don't know. And, you know, a, a couple of the songs I do associate with you, later songs, is like Nick Cave's uh, uh, Late Victorian Holocaust. Oh, yeah. Oh, what a great song. And you do a great, great version of an old Ho- Hoagie Carmichael song, which is I Get Along Very Well Without You. Yeah, it's a great song. Well, it also makes me think of you because you had this very storied life. You were for many people, still more of an image than a performer. Yeah, you were this, I know. this beautiful girl who represented swinging London. <laughs> yes. And when I listen to that song, that's what I hear. I hear you saying, I don't need any of that. Oh, yeah. So tell me, what's, what's next for you? Well, I don't know. It depends on what happens with this record a bit. And also, you know, because I've been so ill, Mm-hmm. With the COVID, I I got so ill, I nearly died, and Hal did, you know, 
and it's taking me a long time to recover. Um, I've got what they call now long-term COVID, and it's going to take a long time to recover. And actually today, before we started this, I was working on my singing, practicing singing with a friend of mine who plays guitar because I was really frightened that I wouldn't be able to sing anymore. Were you afraid you might die at some point? Um, no, it, that didn't cross my mind. <laughs> well, Actually. I'm, <laughs> I'm asking because you were in the middle of a project about romantic poetry, which is, you know, there's the Keats half in, uh, half in love with easeful death. Oh, yeah. But I've, I've known those lines forever. You know, no, I don't think. I really don't think everything is about me. No, oh, I'm not saying really. you thought it was about you, but I, I'm wondering what those lines were like when you were when you were quite sick. I, I wasn't doing it when I was quite sick. I was in fucking hospital. <laughs> you weren't allowed to just sing? Is that what you're telling me? No. Okay. I was much too ill. All I remember about it is that I was in a very, very dark place. And I presume that was being very close to death. Yeah. But I didn't think that at the time. Well, I'm happy that wasn't the case. This is a fabulous album. And it's a thrill to hear it. And I'm glad you finally got to do it. Yeah. Have you got any other ideas that you've had forever and you thought, no, the record company will never go for this? Uh, No, not really, not yet. You know, I am 74, she said. (laughs) I'm not sure how many records I can go on making. I think at least I've got another one. And I'd like it to be songs. And I'd like to write some of them, too. Do you have some ideas already? Uh, No. This record needs to come out. If I've got something ready to come out, it has to come out before I can turn to my next one. I've got ideas and I'm going to sit down and and write something, but I'm not, I'm not feeling very secure about it. Well, listen, I I hope everybody buys this album because it's terrific. Oh God, so do I, because I really need the money. (laughs) Well, you know, this whole thing, the pandemic, really fucked me up, particularly, just like it did everyone else. Do you mean financially as well? Yes. I, uh, they were going to make a, a biopic of my life. And if they had been able to do it, which, of course, they couldn't, I would have made a lot of money. And I really need it. Well, do you, are they, do you think they'll go ahead and do it now that they have a chance? I think, I think some, I hope so. I hope soon, but maybe not quick enough for me. It's really quite desperate. Your life did not get less interesting in the meantime, so there's no reason for them to stop. (laughs) I think you should tell them that. Oh, yeah, I know. I don't know if they realize that. I don't know. You know, the one thing about COVID is um, you can't see people in person. So a lot of old friends are connecting over phones or Zoom or whatever else. Um, Through your sickness, through putting out this album, have you been able to reconnect with some people in your life? Yes and no. I like Zoom because, you know, I, I, I use it um, for sort of, I, I, I have a, a group that I go to, uh, very well known, I won't say its name, which now you can do, you can do it on Zoom. And it's very important to me. And if it wasn't for Zoom, I wouldn't be able to do it at all. Is that still a, a daily thing for you? Yeah. I mean, I don't. I, I only go to a couple of meetings a week, but it's something I always will have to think about. Okay. Well, listen. It's been just wonderful to speak to you. I think we tried to talk to you after your last album, but I'm thrilled I got a chance to speak to you about this one. <laughs> um, well, I think I was already not COVID, but I was getting very ill already with other things. You know, I, I've had a very hard time in the last couple of years. And whatever happened to me, it wasn't me hurting myself. It was coming from outside. All right. Well, take care of yourself now. Thanks, darling. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bruce. 
Thanks to Marianne Faithful for talking through her new album, She Walks in Beauty with Bruce. To hear a playlist of our favorite Marianne Faithful songs, head to brokenrecordpodcast.com. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash brokenrecordpodcast, where you can find extended cuts of new and old episodes. You can follow us on Twitter at Broken Record. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez, with engineering help from Nick Chafee. Our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like our show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music is by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richman. Peace. Peace.